Amen. Show us Christ. Well, greetings. I want to welcome you this morning in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's great to see the body come together to celebrate and to worship our great God. A few announcements, a few bulletin highlights. Uh, the Candy Carnival is next Saturday, October the 20th from 1 to 3.30. Please come, please invite your friends, and most of all, we are really in need of volunteers. So we would love to have you come and be a part of that. There's a table in the back regarding that. The second announcement is Operation Christmas Child. It's hard to believe that we're talking about that, but in, in, on November 11th, we'll be getting together in the gym and putting together these uh, Christmas boxes to be able to send through Samaritan's Purse. And our goal this year is 600 boxes. The other announcement is, is uh, well, all the announcements are important, but especially regarding the men's retreat. It's been a while since we've had the men, a men's retreat. It's time for us to get together, men, again. We're calling all men. God has called us out to be holy. He's called us out to be leaders. He's called us to lead our families, our communities, our churches in holiness. But everything that God commands us to do, Satan is working hard to counter that. So it is not easy for men to be holy. In fact, we are... We are totally overrun today by things that keep us from being holy. Things that we see, things that we hear, our desires, or anything but holiness. And sometimes we think we can handle it. Well, one of the things that our men's retreat wants to do this year, we're going to be going through the, the 1 Timothy chapter 2, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, and the part that talks about being approved, be approved through the Word of God. What does it mean to be approved? Well, well, we'll find out. Word of God teaches us that we are to be men that are approved of God in all the areas of our life. We also realize that we as men, though we think we're tough and we can handle it, we need one another. So one of the goals this, this year at the men's retreat is to get us into a groups, accountability groups, to be able to help one another with, with things like immorality or lust or or other areas of our life that we lack, uh, idolatry or whatever. So we want to encourage you men to come. It's just one night, it's kind of a day and a half, and we would encourage you wives to have your husbands come. It will be to your benefit to have them gone that, that day and a half. So please encourage your wives to come. Now some of you say, can it make it longer? No, actually. <laughs> didn't go quite the way I wanted it to go. But anyway, uh, so please encourage your husbands to go. Husbands, please take this seriously. You will stand before God someday and give an account for how you led your families. And we want to equip you. We want to help you with that. If you are interested, please, there is a sign up in, on the bulletin board in the back. The cost is $88, one night's lodging, four meals. It's a bargain. But if you say, I want to go, but I can't afford the $88, we want you to go, so come see us if that's the case. All right, enough said about that. On our call to worship this morning, we want to look at Psalm 95, verses 1 through 3, and it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. That's why we've come here this morning to worship and praise him. So let's stand and greet one another. Following that, uh, Tom Carlson will lead us in a mission prayer. Oh, brother. Well, good morning. 
You are welcome to stand or sit, whatever would uh, make you feel most comfortable during this time of prayer. Hey, let me just say a few things. Uh, first of all, if you are not feeling comfortable praying in the group and you would like to pray silently, you are welcome to do that. Okay, I just want to make that make you aware of that. Hey, I don't want to run through all these things. I got a mouthful of stuff I've written down on here, and I want to thank Robin for doing that, for writing it on the bulletin. But I do need to clarify a few things on here with regards to both of them. First of all, with regards to Luke Raleigh, let me just explain something here real quick. They have some exciting things happening with World Impact. One of the things they do is they have an evangel school of evangelism. Uh, people groups come. They want to be taught in how to do church planning. One of those groups was a Bengali group out of Queens. They went ahead. They learned how to church, plant churches. They've been planting churches. They have a goal. They want to reach 100,000 Bengali people in the New York City area. Also, they have caught such the vision. They want to reach Bangladesh. They want to go back to that country. And so they have asked Luke if he would go there and begin the Evangel School of Evangelism. He's going there just to start it, and then he's coming back, and then the, it will be led by indigenous people. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I also wanted to clarify that Luke is the director of World Impact at Third Point, and uh, they've had some issues with uh, employments and stuff. People have been stepping down, so he has quite a workload. For those of you who have our mothers and fathers with large families like him, uh, having a large workload and trying to love your children can be a lot. So he's asking for wisdom on that. The final thing I have on there was the candy carnival. I want to tell you something right now. Listen, we are stepping into the, how can I just put it? We are stepping on Satan's toes here over in Linfield. He doesn't like it. There's a bunch of mess going on over there. We need to pray for this candy carnival. And I am asking you to do that right now here this morning. There's some things that are listed on there. One of the things that isn't listed is a hedge of protection around that community because he doesn't want us there. And we are there in the name of Jesus Christ to bring glory to God. And we are going to do that through the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Get together in groups of two or three or as a family unit. If you could go through and pray for these points, I'm sorry I had to do that explanation, but I just wanted to do that real quick. I don't want to take away from this time. We're going to pray for two minutes and, uh, in the, and to honor God and to worship him. This is an exciting time for us to come together as the body of Christ. If there is somebody by themselves, invite them into their group. We're a family here, folks. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Go ahead. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. 
And we are going to pray together your prayer that you taught us to pray. And if everybody could join me, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debtors as we not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks, Tom. Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit and in unity, in faith and the bond of peace. So let's stand together and sing, Oh, how good it is as we worship and praise our God together.
life. In you there's life everlasting. In you there's freedom for my soul. In you there's joy. follow him wherever he leads us, wherever he takes us, and that we continue to say, he is the God who saves. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together. To lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to fall on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that what will they see that our God saves
says this, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. No one else. There is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved, except through the name of Jesus Christ. That is our hope. That is why we gather. So our prayer is show us Christ. Prepare our hearts. Help us to receive and break the hard and stony ground and help our unbelief. Plant your word deep cause it to bear fruit and open up our ears to hear. Lead us in your truth. Let's pray. Let's cry out to God for our hearts. Show us Christ.
Jesus Christ, the cornerstone by which we stand. God, we lay our burdens at your feet, and there's losses here today. There's, there's grieving that's happening right now. And Lord, we lay our burdens with our brothers and sisters down at your feet. We know for the Travisano family, uh, for the Thompson family, Lord, specifically for Matt and Tim, Tiffany and the loss of this child. God, we lay them before you. We, we, as a church family, that we would gather around them and just love and support them in any way we can. We know there are others in this congregation that are still grieving the loss of a loved one. And Lord, we, we cry with them. We help bear their burdens and so fulfill what you've called us to do as the church. But God, pray that you would, like that song says, just break the hard and stony ground, that you would prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us and what you've called us to accomplish in this world. That your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that uh, we carry forth both the love and the truth that is only founded in Jesus Christ our Lord. And God, we just pray in preparation for this sermon today. Be with Pastor Tim. Be with his heart and focus. God, uh, just give him the words that you want him to say. And Lord, we know that each person is here under your sovereign hand and your providence. So God, I pray that you would speak to each heart, you'd speak to each mind, and help them to continue to carry forth what you've called them to do. For those that don't know you, Lord, that you would bring them to repentance. And for those that do know you, that they would continue to live in bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, Lord. God, we pray all these things. We thank you. We honor you. In your name, amen. You may have a seat. Amen. Well, again, we want to welcome you this morning with a great time of worship we had together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I ask you to take the black books and if you would pass them down the aisle and you would legibly sign in for your attendance this morning, uh, we really appreciate that as elders. There is also in the black book uh, uh, an outline for this morning's sermon. Please avail yourself of that. And again, we want to especially welcome our visitors that have come out this morning. We hope that you feel welcome. They ask you to fill out the visitor card that's in that black book. And if you put it in the offering plate or in the back, the welcome center, or give it to somebody, we'll see that it gets to where it needs to be. We're going to continue in our worship this morning by the giving of our tithes and offerings back to God, a portion of what he's given to us. Does the men come forward to do that, please?
Thank you, ladies. Amen. Good to see you this morning. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. So glad to be back with you this morning. With Julie and I and Hudson got to go up to Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire and got to eat lobster and that kind of thing. It was a really nice little getaway and uh, really been wanting to do that for five years. If you don't uh, subscribe to our newsletter that comes out on Wednesdays, I always write a little focus there and I actually attach some pictures that you could look at us if you want to. If you want to go do that, that's great. Um, but you, I hope that you will subscribe to the newsletter so that you can keep up with the church and what's going on in the church and those kinds of things. John chapter 7 this morning is an interesting chapter. Last time we were together, a couple weeks ago, we highlighted this fact that we are in the middle of the week known as the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. It's probably somewhere around autumn time in this setting, um, much like in our time right now, seeing the harvest, seeing the trees, leaves turning colors. It was probably that kind of setting in Jerusalem as Jesus comes into Jerusalem and begins teaching in the temple during this Feast of Tabernacles, which was again one of the three feasts, we've highlighted this, one of the three feasts that the Jews would celebrate annually, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and then this particular feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, which was a celebration of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt as they lived in tents for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness, as they waited to enter into the Promised Land. Like most of the feast, uh, Israel was required to go to back to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. So the city would have most likely been very, very dense, very populated, thousands upon thousands of people, not only from Jerusalem, but Judea and Galilee and even outside of the area had gathered to gather and to celebrate this particular feast. Of course, the temple was the central location. Herod's temple was rebuilt there. You'll remember how beautiful it was, made of cedar and marble and gold. And Jesus, in the middle of the week, shows up to begin teaching. You remember his brothers at the beginning of the chapter had really strongly encouraged him to come up and show himself, but he made that tremendous statement, it's not my time yet, my hour has not yet come. And so Jesus comes in the middle of the week in order to kind of let things settle down, because if you've been with us, you know that the Jewish leaders... Uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes are out to kill him. We see an, intense, an, an intensity of hostility toward Jesus. In fact, this particular chapter here is about six months out before the crucifixion. Six months left, if you will, of the last leg of Jesus as he goes to the cross. It's a sad time because Jesus is seeing such hostility. It's a time of sorrow because it really is a text about the rejection of Jesus. Thus far, we've seen so many different groups. Remember in chapter 6, verse 66, many of the disciples turned away from Jesus, not wanting to follow him anymore. We also saw the rejection of his own family in chapter 7, his brothers refusing to believe. They rejected him as well. Of course, he's rejected by the religious leaders. Chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 7, verse 19, we continue to see this hostility. They want to kill Jesus. And then we see mostly here in this chapter the population of Israel, all of them are rejecting Jesus. It shouldn't surprise us, John told us back in John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, remember that Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now we're seeing all of that fleshed out as the people of Israel reject their Messiah. I've entitled the message this morning, Seek the Lord While He May Be Found. Toward the end of this little, little pericope that Jesus gives us, Jesus speaks into the life of the crowds and he actually says to them a very, very daunting thing, a very, a, really a staunch warning to them. Um, you, you're going to seek me, but you're not going to find me because I'm going to go away. And where I go, you cannot come. I draw this title from this because there was a time there, and, and this is no new, no new thought in the Scripture, that this idea that the time is coming when you will no longer be able to find me. You will no longer be able to seek me. You, you'll seek me, but you won't find me. I won't be there. This is not a new idea. Genesis chapter 6, God said, my spirit, you remember this, my spirit will not always strive with man. It's possible to seek too late, too late. 
And here we see in this particular chapter, the crowds will, will, will not seek him and it will be too late for, for them. And there will be a time when Jesus will no longer be there and they won't be able to find him. In fact, they will be separated from him for all of eternity. That's the end of the chapter. So there are warnings throughout all of the Old Testament and New Testament as well. But this is really a warning passage for all of us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Listen to the voice of Jesus. There will be a time when it will be too late to seek the Lord. And you will be separated from Jesus for all of eternity. So it's a warning passage for the religious leaders. It's a warning passage for the populace there in Jerusalem. But it's also a warning passage for us. So this morning, John chapter 7, verses 25 through 26 If you don't have a Bible, grab a pew Bible, follow along with us as we read. This is so important. There's 30 minutes or so left in our message here. Let's give our hearts attentively to the Word and hear what God has for us. At Ebenezer, we like to stand in honor of God's Word, so won't you stand with me? Let's read it together. John chapter 7. Let's begin in verse 25. We'll read down through verse 36 together. Remember, again, this is in the middle of the week, the middle of the feast. We don't know exactly what day it is, but... Somewhere in the middle of the week. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will find you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Look down at verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him. But no one laid hands on him. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we pray now that the Holy Spirit would come and attend to our hearts. Lord, may this word come alive to us. And may you speak to us. Father, maybe there's one here today that needs to seek your face. Seek the face of Jesus. Oh, I pray that you would grant them grace and mercy. While there is still time, that they would turn to Christ and follow him. Father, bless now the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Keep your Bibles open. Grab an outline if you didn't grab one. Here in this particular chapter, we see a group of a crowd that are undeciding, undeciders, if you will. We also see the Pharisee, the religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes here. They join forces to kill Jesus. In fact, they're at odds at many times in historical settings they didn't agree with one another yet they did agree with this one thing that they wanted to kill Jesus and yet at the end of this chapter Jesus pronounces this warning to them whether you're undecided or whether you're an outright hater of Jesus the end result is still the same you will be separated from God for all of eternity so there is no hierarchy of of unbelievers, if you will. There aren't some unbelievers that are better than other unbelievers. You you can be an undecider, or you can be a hater of Jesus, and in the end, you will go to the same place, separated from God for all of eternity. So the exhortation for us this morning is seek the Lord while He may be found. 
Since our eternal destiny is at stake, confused crowds must not turn us away from believing and seeking the Lord while He may be found. That's really the theme of this little particular chapter. We're going to see three things this morning. I want to look at the confused crowd. I want to look, secondly, at the claims of Jesus. And then third, I want us to look at the careless choice of many who refuse to believe in Jesus. So let's look this morning. Number one would be this, the crowds. We want to look at the crowds, the confused crowds. And here's my exhortation to us. Avoid the confused crowds. Avoid them. Avoid listening to the confused crowds who superficially and incorrectly judge Jesus because they refuse to truly look at the evidence. In fact, at the end of the last section that we saw, chapter 7, you'll remember verse uh, 24, Jesus ended that little section telling the crowds, listen, don't judge based upon appearances, but judge with right judgment. Listen to what I've said and make a right judgment. Don't base it upon your appearances. Don't base it upon your preconceived ideas, but make a right judgment about Jesus. So we see the fulfilling, really the anti-fulfilling of this particular statement because the crowds don't do that. They're very confused. They're very confused. And they don't look at the, the ob objective evidence of who Jesus is, what He said, and who He is, and where He claimed to be from. Verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem said, and you can see their confusion here, is this not the man they seek to kill? Now who are these people? They're probably Jerusalemites. The people who lived in the city, who knew uh, the religious leaders of the day, and they knew their leaders well. They knew the motives of their leaders. They knew that these leaders were out to kill Jesus. And now Jesus is standing in the temple and he's preaching. He's preaching about the kingdom of God. He's preaching about sin. He's preaching about who he was as, a, as the Messiah. Very blasphemous statements to these religious leaders. And yet they let him continue to teach. They let him continue to teach. They say nothing. He's speaking there openly and they say nothing to him. This is probably Jerusalemites, again, who knew what their leaders were thinking it was well known to them, very well known to them. This crowd, look at verse 20. You'll remember the crowd, some of the crowd says, well, who, what are you saying? You, have a, you must have a demon. Those probably weren't Jerusalemites. Those were probably some of the other crowd coming from Galilee or Judea or other areas that may not have known uh, the religious leaders' hearts as well as Jerusalem did. But here these Jerusalemites are confused. Here Jesus is in the temple. They want Him dead, and now they're letting Him teach, and no one is stopping Him. So they're confused as to, to why they don't stop His teaching. They don't seize Him. In fact, this temple area is their authority. It's their domain. It's their space. They're in charge. And yet they continue to let Jesus teach. They kind of begin mulling over this in verse 26 when they ask this question, could it be that the religious leaders have come to the agreement that He is the Messiah? Look at 26. He's open, openly speaking. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Has the, have the leaders really changed their minds? Well, that, change, that thought changes dr dramatically at the end of 26. Uh, when they say, come to their own... Actually, verse 27, that thought goes away quickly when they say to themselves, well, no, He can't be the Messiah because we know where Jesus is has come from. We know that he is a son of a carpenter. In fact, this is one of the arguments that keeps coming up. Remember back over in chapter 6, verse 42, uh, the crowds and even the religious leaders said, this is, not, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can they say, how can he now say that he's come down from heaven? So there's a real confusion in the crowds. They're not really following the leaders. They're not following... What Jesus is saying here. And most likely, this claim that they're saying here in verse 27, well, we know where Jesus has come from, is probably from a misinterpretation of a couple of passages. You might make note of these passages on your outline. Malachi, particularly Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, or Isaiah 53. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 was probably a passage that developed somewhat of a tradition in Israel. And that tradition was that when the Messiah comes, no one will really know where He's come from. He will come in suddenly. In fact, that's the word that's used there in Malachi chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into His temple, and the messenger of that covenant in whom you delight, behold, He is coming. 
course, I believe that's a fulfill, that was fulfilled when Jesus went into the temple and turned over, overturned all the tables and ran out the animals of the temple. But there was this tradition floating around in Israel that when the Messiah comes, really no one will know where he is. In fact, that's the Isaiah 53 passage when really there's this statement, who shall declare his generation? In other words, who will know anything about his family at all? There was kind of this tradition, and I'm going to say this very importantly, a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of the Scripture that led them to quickly reject that Jesus was the Messiah. It was a misinterpretation of both of these passages, and it developed into some popular notion, again, that this Messiah would some, some kind of have some supernatural arrival at the temple, not in a formal way, and no one would know anything about him at all. In fact, over in verse 40, we read that. Verse 40, some of them were saying that he was a prophet. Others were saying that he was the Christ. Of course, some were saying that he had, you know, was coming from the offspring of David. Of course, the religious leaders knew this. You remember in Matthew chapter 2, when Herod was seeking about that star that appeared, this king that was to be born. You remember it was the religious leaders that said, oh, no, 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 it's out of Bethlehem the Messiah is to come. Go to Bethlehem. Well, notice very clearly the religious leaders know this, but they don't mention it at all. They don't try to, to solve the confusion of the crowds at all, one bit, one bit. And so the unbelieving crowds are justifying, notice this justification of their rejection. Oh, Jesus can't be the Messiah. We don't know where, we know where he's come from. We know his family. I mean, we know that he's the son of, a, of Joseph, at least physically that's what they're saying. We know that he's the son of God, but he's the son of Joseph and the son of Mary. He's got brothers. He comes from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth, does it? And so they're saying all of these things. The crowds are confused about Jesus. And here's why. Let me just give you two things here to consider, and it's the same for us today. Confusion comes from misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the Scripture. But why and how important it is that we interpret Scripture correctly, that we understand what the Scripture says. Had they just done a little research, they would have seen very clearly that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem, that He was the one who was God's Son. That's why Jesus is saying, look, don't make a judgment based upon appearances. Do your homework. Go into the... Go into the, 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 the archives and look at the records that Jesus really wasn't born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. And by the way, isn't that what Matthew's whole genealogy is all about? Where Matthew lays out the genealogy of both Mary and Joseph. Well, one, one in Luke, but, but particularly Joseph and Mary there. That, that Both of them come from the line of David. There's a second thing that we've got to avoid. Number two, confusion comes by a superficial reading of the Scripture. We see this is true not only of the crowds, but it's also true in our day as well. People who don't look at the Scripture seriously. There are people who deny that Jesus was God in the flesh even today, and we're very familiar with him. In the first century, I don't know if you're familiar with a man by the name of Arius. Arius brought forward early deceptions in the church, early first century, second, actually second century, taught that Jesus was the greatest of all created beings, that he wasn't eternally God. The great church father Athanasius stood up against him, firmly against Arius, and fi they, the church finally adopted what we know as the Nicene Creed, which affirmed that Jesus was eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Today we still have the crowds confused about Jesus in the form of what we know as Jehovah Witnesses. They're still denying the deity of Jesus. We could throw the Mormons in that category as well. A superficial reading of the text or an adding to the text is what the Mormons do, adding the Book of Mormon to this particular text of Scripture. So we must avoid the crowds. And let me just say this before we look at the second point here. The crowds still misunderstand Jesus today. The crowds are still pulling people away from what the truth of Christ is. We must, listen, we must avoid the crowds. Everywhere in Scripture that the crowds are mentioned, it's really not usually in a, in a, positive, a positive slant. The crowds usually have everything wrong, and they're always going in the wrong direction, which should remind us to remind our children, listen, kids, listen to me, all the kids in here, listen to me. Don't follow the crowd. Are you listening to me, kids? Don't follow the crowds. 
especially the worldly crowds, they will lead you astray. They will cause you, they will cause you to misunderstand the Bible. They will cause you to misinterpret the Bible. And if you follow the ways of the crowds, and some of you kids, let me just tell you, I, can, I, I know I hear stories, you're being sucked away from the truth of who Jesus is by people who don't know Jesus. We see it, don't we, parents? We see it all the time. Avoid the crowds. Avoid what they're saying. Avoid where they're going. They turn their hearts against Christ. And isn't it just like the crowds to always have some kind of way to justify their rejection of Jesus? Oh, same today, isn't it? Same today. Well, that leads us to the second thing because Jesus stands up in the middle of the temple and with a loud voice, He begins to make claims. And we better listen to these claims. So here's the second thing. Number two, Believe the claims of Christ. Clearly listen and believe in what Jesus testifies about Himself. So in the midst of all this confusion, in the midst of the rejection of the religious leaders and the rejection of the populace, the crowds, Jesus stands up and John says that He begins to proclaim. Look at verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed. That really doesn't do justice for that word. That word is to cry out. That word is a loud, a word that implies a loud voice. Jesus, with as loud a voice as he can say, cries out and makes some statements to the crowds. Look at what he says, verse 28. You know me, and you know where I come from. I think that's irony here. I think that's irony here because Jesus says in the next verse, you don't know me, you don't know where I've come from. But I have not come of my own. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So he cries out real loud, saying, listen up. The first thing he says is, you know me, and you know where I come from. That may be a reference to the fact that they know that he's come from Nazareth. But there's a really difficulty here, because over in chapter 8 and other places, particularly chapter 8, verse 19, Jesus specifically says, look, you don't know me, you don't know my Father. And here in the latter part of this little verse, verse 29, you don't know me at all. You don't know me. If you knew me, you would know my Father as well also. So it's very clear here, seeing that at the end of verse 28, Jesus is saying, look, you really don't know me and you don't know God. You don't know God. Which, by the way, would have been a huge shock to the Jews. Go tell them they don't know God. That was one of their prideful accomplishments other than the Gentiles they're the one they're the worshipers of the one true God so now Jesus is telling them outright you don't know me and you don't know God so there's a little irony here but the bottom line is you're confused and you're in your unbelief to say that you know me is really ridiculous you you might know where I am physically but you don't know where I am spiritually you don't know the one who sent me so there are two claims that Jesus makes here, and let's just kind of summarize them in two, two ways here. There's two things that Jesus makes claim to. Number one would be this. He testifies, number one, that he had not come from himself, but that he had been sent to earth by God. Notice he says, I have not come on my own accord. Now, when we come to these little phrases like this, really focus in here for just a little bit. Notice what Jesus is saying. I haven't come on my own. I've been sent. I've come not come on my own, but I have been sent. In fact, the one who sent me is true, which is the word really faithful. God is faithful. The Father is faithful. He's the one who sent me, which reminds us of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God the Father is so faithful to love sinners that He sent His Son to redeem them to go to the cross in the fullness of time, God sent forth His own Son into the world to be born of a woman that He might go to the cross and die for sinners. This is the faithfulness of the Father. You don't know Him. I know Him. I come from Him. That's the second claim. We'll get to that in just a moment. But notice this claim here. Jesus says, listen, I have not come from Myself, but I have been sent. Now there are three, uh, three inferences we can make from this statement. I'll just give them to you briefly. Three inferences to this statement. What does this mean? Well, it means that Jesus is eternal. I don't know if you caught that or not. If Jesus has been sent by the Father, it means that Jesus has always been with the Father. So Jesus is making a claim here, isn't He? I am not just a human. 
My existence didn't begin when I was born of Mary. When I was born of the virgin woman Mary, my existence began before then. I have always been. You remember in chapter 8, he'll tell religious leaders, listen, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Not I was, but I am. Speaking of God's title, which was used of Yahweh in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said, I am who I am. Tell Moses, Moses, tell the people, I am sent you. Jesus says that over in 8, chapter 8, verse 58. So Jesus is claiming eternality with the Father. John chapter 17, verse 5, in his high priestly prayer, Jesus will say the same thing. He's praying there and he prays to his Father and he says, Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, Jesus is either a, mani- a, a, a maniac, he's, he's lost his mind. Who could make statements like this? I used to exist with my Father in heaven. I mean, we, we would send someone to a psychiatric ward saying they're crazy if they're making statements like this. But this is reality. Jesus was eternal. He has always been. He's claiming to be the eternal God in human flesh. He's always existed Again, contrary to what the crowds will agree, and contrary to what the Jehovah Witnesses will teach, contrary to what the Mormons will teach. Listen, be careful about the crowds. Be careful. Secondly, it also implies that Jesus operated under the full authority of God. I've been sent. I've been sent by God. Over in chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus said, My teaching is not mine, but His who sent me. Back in chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees His Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So when Jesus says, I've been sent, He's saying, I'm I'm acting on authorial uh, sending of the Father. I've been sent with with authority to speak on behalf of God. All right, This this is His claim. Which if we say it, outright here's the implication of this if you reject the claims of jesus you also reject the claims of god let's just nail it down as straightforward as we can if you reject jesus and his teaching then you do not know god and you reject the father's teaching that's why jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except through me this is authorial this is Uh, the authority that Jesus has. Then there's a third implication. Number three, to be sent by God means that Jesus was under the Father's providential protection. We see that in verse 30. If you look at verse 30, I love this. So they were seeking to arrest Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Now, this is going to be continually stated in the Gospel of John over and over and over. This hour of Jesus had not yet come. Chapter 8, verse 20. Chapter 12, verse 23. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 different times in the Gospel of John. This hour has not come. What does this hour refer to? Well, it definitely refers to to the hour that Jesus is going to the cross to die for us. The hour that God determined that Jesus would go make make reconciliation for sinners, that He would become a propitiation, a satisfaction of God's wrath. That's what propitiation means. Satisfaction of God's wrath on the cross. That He would die as a substitute for sinners in our place. And Jesus, notice Jesus is very confident that He's not going to that hour until the appointed time. Until the appointed time. And here's the point that we want to make. To be sent by God means that Jesus was under the Father's providential protection. Providential protection. No one could touch Jesus until the Father had providentially determined the time which would be a, was determined before the foundation of the world. Now, before we go on to the third uh, point here, is that not true? Second point here, is that not also true of us? True of us. Haven't we been sent by the Father? John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus told the disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I also send you. Let me ask you, do you worry about people touching you, not physically, but doing harm to you? Do you worry about your life not falling into place? Do you worry about this or that? Listen, 
Are you not also an ambassador of Jesus? Have you not also been sent into the world to represent God and to tell others about Christ and be the mouthpiece of Jesus to a lost world? Why do you worry about things unfolding the way you want them? Shouldn't we also entrust ourselves to the providential care of God, knowing that just as no one could touch Jesus until the appointed hour, so it is true of us? That no one can touch us and harm us or change God's plan for us unless God providentially allows it. So here's the first thing Jesus claims. Number one, he claims to be sent by the Father. But then there's a second thing, and we don't want to rush by this too quickly. He testifies that he secondly knew God, that he knew God. Look at it again in verse 29. I know him. For I come from him, and he sent me. Now, I don't want to rush over this too quickly, but listen with your heart what Jesus is saying. I know him. I know the Father in an intimate way. In an intimate way, I know him. The crowds didn't know him. The world doesn't know him. But Jesus is saying, I have a unique and thorough knowledge of the Father because I am one with the Father. I alone existed with the Father from all of eternity. I'm the one who can disclose to you the Father. John chapter 1, verse 18. And isn't this really true salvation, eternal life? John chapter 17, verse 3. That they may know the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you sent. So before we look at the last point here, let me ask you, do you know God? Do you know Him? You only know Him through Jesus. Unbelievers, the Scripture says, are separated from God, darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. But we know God through Jesus. We know Him intimately. The Apostle Paul, you remember, prayed, Oh, that I might know Him. The power of His resurrection. Let me ask you, do you know Him? I'm not asking, do you know about Him? I'm asking, do you have a relationship? Have you entered into a personal relationship with the Father that comes only through Jesus Christ? Have you come to know Jesus personally? Not in an academic sense, not knowing about God, but have you entered into a personal relationship with God? Oh, seek Him while He may be found. Seek Him while he may be found. And that leads us to the third point. And this is the warning, number three. Number three, prevent a careless choice. Your eternal destiny depends upon believing in Jesus while you still have opportunity. Now look over, by the way, in verse 31, we see a division, yet many of the people believed in him. I'm not sure that's real belief. That may be kind of like John chapter 2, in John chapter 2, where many supposedly believed in him, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. So we're not sure if those, that's real belief, but if it is, then it's definitely still split. Some believed, others uh, wanted to, to arrest him. Verse 30, some wanted to arrest, some believed. So maybe some of them were true believers. We're not sure here. But then notice verse 32. And we'll end this here with this sobering claim that Jesus makes. The Pharisees heard the crowds muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. So these are temple officers, and they're sent to arrest him. They're going to, down in verse 46, they're going to be bewildered by the things they hear Jesus say. But notice what Jesus says. Then he said to them, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Do you hear the sorrow in Jesus' voice here? I will be with you a little longer. He knows his time is about up. Six months left on the earth. This is a sad statement, isn't it? I'll be out of your hair in just a few months. I, I won't bother you anymore and you'll kill me and... You'll look for me then, but you won't be able to find me. Jesus is giving them a warning. He's also very sovereign in his thinking, isn't he? I don't know if he understands exactly what they're thinking. He's making these statements here. 
But what does he mean when he says, I'm going to my Father? Well, he says, I came down from heaven. I'm going back to my, to my Father in heaven. And where I'm going, there you cannot come. Very same thing over in chapter 8, verse 21. Very same thing. I'm going away. You will seek me and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So there's two things here that I want to highlight. Two things. Here's the warning. Number one, if you don't come to Jesus, you will be shut out of heaven. This is what Jesus is saying. Listen closely. If you don't come to me, I'm going away, and where I go, you cannot come. Are you putting the the dots together? This is what Jesus is saying. If you don't come to me, if you don't believe in me, If you reject me, I'm going to heaven, and when I go there, you will not be able to come where I am. That's devastating. That's hell. You know what makes hell so devastating? Is that people in hell will, will never forget, listen to me, they will never forget that they had an opportunity to believe in Christ. Hell is a place Scripture talks about it being a place of suffering, yes, but it's also a place of resentment. It's a place of unrelieved bitterness. It's an eternal regret without remedy. It's an everlasting remorse. I think that's what the weeping and gnashing of teeth is, right? Um, This weeping and wailing is because they knew they had an opportunity and they will be separated from God for all of eternity. Where the worm never dies, uh, scholars believe the worm is the conscience of those in hell. It never dies. It continually eats at them because they will be resentful that they didn't choose Christ. They had an opportunity. They were warned, but they didn't come to Christ. That's what hell is. Hell is not where Christ is forgotten. Hell is where Christ is totally unavailable. Christ will never be forgotten in hell. Ever. Jesus here warns them, if you don't come to Christ, you will be shut out from heaven for all of eternity. Now there's one other thing, and this is what we see about the crowds. What do they say to him? The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go? You hear the mockery here. It's almost sarcasm. Where does he intend to go that we can't find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks? This is mockery. This is uh, dismissing Jesus. And here's the second thing that we want to notice. Number two, don't squander your opportunity. Don't mock Jesus but come to Him while He may be found. Come to Him. Don't mock Him. Don't minimize Him. Don't dismiss Him. Listen to Him. Come to Him. What does that mean? It means repent of your sins. Turn your heart away from your sin and come to Christ. Come to Him and you'll be saved from your sins. Don't dismiss the words of Jesus. What a warning for us all. John chapter 8, verse 21 says, if you don't come to Christ, you will die in your sins unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our eternal destinies are at stake. That's why Jesus says, listen, seek the Lord while He may be found. That's why I entitled this message this, seek the Lord while He may be found. If you hear His voice, if you hear His his warnings, don't turn away like the crowds did and mocked Him, but seek the Lord Seek the Lord while you still have time. There may be a time in your life, listen to me, we're done. There may be a time in your life where you don't have that opportunity anymore. Where you don't ever hear the voice of God anymore. Jesus is saying, listen, receive me, come to me. I hope you've done that this morning. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ. Listen, we we exist as a church to help you Come to know these truths and to believe on the Lord Jesus. We're here to help you. We want to be a community of believers that can help you grow and understand the Word. If you're here and you're new to all of this, come find me after the service. Let's talk about these things. Let's get these things right. and Make sure that if you were to die today, you wouldn't be separated from God in hell for all of eternity. You would spend eternity with Him. Let's get this right. Let's get this right today. Bow your heads with me. If you're here this morning and you've trusted Jesus Christ, give Him praise and glory. You've heard His voice. By His grace, you've responded. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, we invite you to come to Christ. Believe on Him 
while you still have opportunity, while you still have time, trust Christ. And for all of us who have heard the good news, haven't we also been sent into this world to go tell others about who Jesus is? None of us want anyone to be separated from God for all of eternity. So we go and we tell. And we speak the good news of Christ. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you need help. Come find me at the end of the service. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the words of Christ. Thank you for these warnings. Oh, Father, may we not squander the opportunity that we have. We have time now. We can seek Jesus while He is found now. But there's a time coming when that time may no longer exist. Father, oh, work in hearts. Draw sinners to Yourself. Help their eyes to be opened and their hearts to be softened. And for all of us who have received Christ, oh, we look forward to that day when we'll see Him face to face. Stand in His presence with Him. Father, now bless Your Word. Produce great fruit in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Well, let's stand together and sing about standing in the presence of Jesus as we sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Christ, you will see him face to face and you will be with him for all of eternity. Lord bless you. Have a great week this week. You're dismissed. Amen.